this time of year especially in that. I think about how God loves all of us as if there was one of us. And he would have done the same thing if there was only one of us that he done.
to give your tithes and offerings. There is a plate in the front and at the back. And so many of you all are so kind to bring it up before the service or put it in there you know, afterwards. We're very thankful for that because we're doing ministry. We're doing work uh, for God, which requires us to be able to buy things that hold stuff like Easter egg hunts and to be able to do things like serve food at the different celebration dinners and be able to uh, turn on the lights and the AC and heat over in the gym for our open gym basketball. I tell you, Connie uh, Bolton took me some pictures the other night. I was standing there. We had uh, some committee meetings going on over here, and I was going back and forth. We had 10 people that don't go to church here playing basketball over in the gym uh, on Thursday night. And uh, that's just tremendous. That's a, it's a new outreach into the community. And by the way, none of them were over 30. So uh, <laughs> that's a good outreach into this church, all right? So I appreciate that you are faithful in your giving and generous in that. And God is blessing that. Do we have uh, prayer requests this morning? Stuff to pray over. I know Jill mentioned her mother moving. Besides the ones that are listed in your book. Yes, Carol. My mom's doing the same thing. Um, she's going to move in with my brother, but we're just starting the process, so she's not quite ready to pack up, but she's been cleaning out, and it is very hard. And it's hard to watch, and it's hard to be patient, <laughs> And um, but we're just trying to let her kind of lead the way um, with it. It's the best route, we believe. And, um, but anyway, she's kind of going through the same thing. Her name's Mary. Okay. Someone else? I know Marge mentioned last week Scott, her grandson Scott. He needs our prayers. Okay. Just pray that he will get that God will give him what he needs. Okay. Lois? Will and Callista Mefford, they both have COVID and they've got a six month old baby and a seven year old son with them. Yeah, they both have COVID. Their children do not currently, but they both have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Will and Callista, never. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right. Let's bow our heads and we'll. Anybody got a praise this morning before we pray? For the sun shining outside. Hey, Amen. Man. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, my house was still standing when I got back, so praise the Lord for that. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord, we are thankful people this morning. We are blessed uh, in where we live. This is an awesome town. It's an awesome state, and it is uh, just absolutely gorgeous here, and it's a beautiful time of year that's coming up. And uh, Lord, we are thankful that you have brought us safe travel, that you have prepared a place for us, that there were people who sacrificed through the years to build this building, and I know you are the builder. I know you're the one that did it, but it, it, it gives us rooms to meet in and a place to worship and kitchens to cook in and places to play and we are thankful for that we are thankful for all the people that participate in our worship services and our leaders in our church and lord we we just thank you for that this morning we thank you for your love and grace and mercy we ask that you hear our prayer requests this morning we lift them up to you and and we ask that you bring healing where it is needed lord so many people that are struggling right now and, and uh, we need your healing hand we ask you would protect will and Callista's two children from covid and Lord, we ask that you would uh, bring healing to Scott and anything that he needs, Lord. I pray that for each situation where people are moving, that you would help them to, to see the beauty in that and the joy in that. And uh, I know there's sadness that comes as well. Lord, we ask you to bless our Easter egg hunt, that you bless our Holy Week services. I ask, Lord, that you would, um, uh, in everything that we do, that you would empower us to produce fruit for you, Lord. That you'd bless these tithes and offerings, that they would be... Uh, multiply. Uh, Lord, you have, you have been so gracious to us all, and uh, we ask that uh, we're thankful that we can give back to uh, as well, Lord. Um, bless the rest of this service. Give me the words of life to speak today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's time for our kids' message, and that's going to take a little bit of coordination. Um, so the kids can come forward for the kids' message. And I'm going to get something out of the hallway there. Celia, you can come on in. Walk down the middle aisle with it. Open it up. Make sure it's open.
last week. I know. Look, look, we got volunteers. I love it. Uh, here you go. There you go. Now, last week we talked about uh, being able to see and how blessed we are in terms of our five senses, right? And today, I just carried in two things. I want you all to know that I am a strong Christian man, but there are times when I am going to admit my weakness. We will go, and we will drive, Eloise, to a theater, and we will go, and I'll be in the parking lot. On the way there, driving, Jimmy, I'm not kidding. I'm driving, I'm going, we are not getting popcorn. I'm going to be honest with you. We're not going to pay $25 for a bucket of popcorn. I don't care. We're not paying it. We're not going to. We, we, right? We're agreements. We're all agreement. I'll say I, I. We get in the car. We walk in. We get our tickets. We pay the money to get in. And as soon as I walk in that door, I go, And I go right over there, and I go, they said, I said, how much is this popcorn? And they go, just sign your paycheck over to me. And I go, okay, all right, I'm going to sign this over to you. Get some popcorn with butter on it. I can't help myself. It smells so good that I'm just like, I got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. Cinnamon rolls in the mall are a very similar thing. And Jimmy sometimes smells like cinnamon rolls. He makes so many of them. He makes them homemade, and they are so scrumptious. They're so good. But when cinnamon rolls are cooking, man alive. Uh, you just go, <sighs> right? And, and Heidi just got back from the beach as well. And, and I know she says, you know, you walk out there on the beach and you smell the, the, this, the smell that's blowing in off the ocean, how beautiful it is. And it just refreshes you. Those smells are something that's a blessing from God. They are just tremendous things. And so for us, we need to be thankful. I mean, think of all of the stuff because I know when I go to, uh, I've been to Martha Barron's house and she has beautiful flowers around her mailbox in the spring and summertime. The Pullins have a yard full of beautiful flowers. I know many of you do, but when you walk out your front door and you smell that, you go, wow, those, those flowers smell incredible. And so every single thing, there are people who pray, I hear them praising Jesus when they walk in the front door because we have some kind of potpourri that's by the front door and they go, that smells really good. I like that, that smell. And so it's odd to say we're thankful for smell, but man, I am. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful because I have four children. What a new baby smells like. Oh. The good times. The good times. Are the good times right? <laughs> um, but babies have that beautiful smell to them. I don't know what it is um, when they're just so little, but the smell of perfume, all of those things just <coughs> enhance our life and make it better. And so today we're thankful for our sense of smell. And Celia, you can lead them all, you know, the kids out in the hallway there if they would like it. Uh, we're not going to eat it here, but you can lead them out there in the hallway. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day and the, the, the wonderful smells that are all around us. And um, I'm just amazed at how you bless us every single day. And, and we praise you for the big things. You know, if somebody, if, if we, uh, you know, buy a new house or something, we're praising your name and those kind of things. But in those smaller things that we've become accustomed to, we sometimes miss that and we forget <laughs> to praise you for the, the wonderful smells that are all around us. Thank you for that. Use it to bring our attention to how grateful and thankful we should be to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are going to be studying in a couple of different places today. And... We're in the Old Testament. We're going to be in, in 2 Kings some. But our scripture today is actually from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And it is laying some groundwork for us theologically. And it's I'm trying to get you to a point to where we understand Matthew 28, the Great Commission. That, remember we talked about for the last few weeks our rucksack, our, our backpack that we've been loading up to go out into the world and to accomplish these things that God has for us, the, the, the things that he has prepared for us to do. Now let's look together, Ephesians 2, and it's verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So today, you know, I hope that God blesses this and that we can really kind of take in what 
the sermon title is, which is Alive, Dive, and Thrive when we're out there. When we go finally go out into the world. Remember last week we left our, for, you know, forgiveness is the thing that we needed to bring to the table to keep us from being ineffective in our ministry. And so today we're going to talk about once we go out into the world, what kinds of things are we going to be about? Now, remember Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Uh, no, no, let me, no, let me skip over that. Let, let, if you've got your pew Bible, let's look at it together. These are Jesus' last words to us, so they are powerful and they, they should carry meaning for us. 28, 19 of Matthew. First book of the New Testament. This is Matthew, and he's got another name, Levi. He's a tax collector who wrote this book. Has a Jewish bent to it. And Jesus speaking as he, as he goes, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, some versions will say obey there, observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. All right, so this is our calling. This is the, the marching orders that we have. If you're in the military, if you are going out, if you are a business person, a salesman, your boss has given you some kind of plan to say, this is what today is going to look like. He said, here, go do this. It may just be making deliveries. It may be that you're going to meet with customers. It may mean that uh, uh, you're just going to stock the shelves. Whatever it might be, you have marching orders. You have the plan for the day. And so for us, we're going to talk about alive first. Okay, so I want us, because we have to acknowledge this, go back to 2 Kings, and let's look together in chapter 5 of 2 Kings. This is the story of Naaman. We're only going to spend just a very short time here because I have preached on this lately. Um, and we'll look at chapter 5, verse 9. 2 Kings 5, 9. Naaman had leprosy. Incurable illness that was very contagious, um, and he was part of a foreign guard. He was an Aramean, and so uh, he was the general in the army, but he was a very, very sick man and always looking for an answer to this leprosy. His slave girl, his wife's attendant, said, there's a prophet down in Israel, and you can go to him, and he will give you healing. And so he's grasping at straws at this point. He's, he's desperate, and so it says in chapter 5, verse 9, then Naaman went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over this place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far, far, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And it's at that point that another person, a servant in his entourage, says, if he had told you to go to Mount Everest and walk up all the stairs to the very top up there and stay there for 30 days and wait in the freezing cold, would you have done it to be healed of your leprosy? And he goes, uh, yeah. And he says, why not just go down to the river and wash like he said seven times? It's easy. It's simple. It's right over there. And he goes, okay. And he goes down and dips himself in the water seven times. And he's healed of his leprosy. And he goes back praising God and praising Elisha for what just went on. He's alive. He has been healed of what ailed him. And for us, as we're going out, we should be rejoicing. We should be whistling as we go because of all that God has forgiven us of. And that he has said in John 10, 10, as I read earlier, he's given us life and life to the full. The reason that we're not whistling as we go, the reason that we're not sitting there in this joyous, thankful mood is because we think a certain way it should happen. We think there's a certain thing that's supposed to happen and that God is going to do it by making us wealthy, that God is going to do it by making us somehow, uh, you know, very famous, that, uh, you know, that when we walk out, people are going to go, it's Chris Paul. Wow, look at that. That's, that's somebody right there, right? That's what we have in our head that our ministry should look like. That we should be like Billy Graham and that we should be, you know, it's nice that I get to speak at Mount Pleasant Church, right? But would it, would it be different if I was speaking at Nayland Stadium or the big stadium where Vanderbilt plays or MTSU's arena, right? We would love that. We would go, Chris Caldwell is going to be here. We're going to fill all 108,000 seats to hear him speak. And we go, now that's more like it right there, right? But that's not what God says. God says, 
I want you to go out that front door. And when you go out there, I'm going to put people in your path for you to minister to. What's the point? The point is, is that we minister to them. They're blessed. And what happens to us? I call this Australian theology, Marty. It's Australian theology. When we minister to them, what boomerangs back to us? We get ministered to. We get the blessing as well. We grow in our faith. If you go teach junior highs, yes, they're going to get smarter in their faith. They're going to grow in the knowledge of the Bible. But what happens to you at the same time? You grow in your faith because you're studying like crazy because they're going to pepper you with questions, right? You're, you're growing as well. So there is this idea of us going out and that we are alive. God says, I'm, I'm, I'm making you free and free indeed. He says, when we go out that door, I'm going to show you things you've never seen before. You're going to see me move out there in the world. And you will give me praise because you see miracles, signs, wonders, and healings in the midst of all that's going on. You're going to see lives changed that you said there's absolutely no way. I have shared with you that my uncle, absolutely, in his 50s, right? In his 50s, he is out in his driveway on the cell phone calling his brother at Christmas time saying, I just want you to know that I burned that Christian Christmas card that you sent me out here in my driveway. Don't send me any more of that junk over here in my house. He's like, okay, okay, I won't send you any more of that stuff. And then like 10 years later, we're sitting at Thanksgiving, and my aunt, this guy, that's the guy that was so mean and nasty, the guy that even as a pastor, I'm a pastor, I'd written him off. I said, that guy's never going to be a Christian. He said it adamantly. He is, he's just rotten to the core. And we're sitting at Thanksgiving, and we're sitting there eating our turkey, and his wife, my aunt, is sitting there, and she goes, I have to tell you what went on in Sunday school the other day. Every fork hit the plates and on the floor. Everything is going down. I mean, she got ping, 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 like this, right, all over the place, because everybody's like, what did you just say? And she said, I can't tell you what happened in Sunday school. You were in Sunday school the other day? And she goes, oh, we've been going to church for a couple of years now. Yeah, we teach a second grade Sunday school class. Uh, oh. Jeff and I. And I'm like, and he had come to know the Lord in a church service and gave his life to Christ and now was serving as a teacher in a second grade Sunday school class. And I was sitting there going, oh, there's no way that guy's going to heaven. There ain't no way. I've known him all my life. There's absolutely no way that guy could get saved. He's too far gone. And yet, who makes us alive? Jesus. And that's what Naaman is sitting there. Naaman's going, I'm a general. I should be treated better than this. Don't send some servant out to me. I, you know, come, come tell me to do some, do some dance, do some special, you know, wear a ornamental robe when you're doing this and blow smoke on me and do, you know, something that's, that's you know, I'm a general. He goes, hey, sends out a servant, go wash yourself seven times in that river over there. And he says, but we're supposed to be alive when we go out. Okay, so let's look at the second one. This dive part. Flip back one page. Let's look at uh, chapter four. So 2 Kings 4. And we're going, to, we're going to be here for just a minute. In verse 1, so 2 Kings 4, 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Are those dire circumstances? I don't know anybody sitting here who's worried that their kid is going to be taken as a slave. And yet this woman is facing that right there. Both of her children to be taken away. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you come in, you shall shut the door behind you and you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went, now hang on a second, hang on a second, because I'm not stupid. I'm not ignorant here. And yet he says, she comes to him and she says, I need some help financially because my kids are about to be sold into slavery. And he says, what do you got on hand? And she says, all I have, and it's not crude oil. It's not, it's not a 55-gallon drum of crude oil sitting over here, right? This is actually probably olive oil of some sort. Right, that she's got a small jar of. We don't keep it in 55-gallon drums right there in our house, right there in a small, it's a small jar. And he says, go borrow a bunch of vessels and bring them to your house, as many as you can get. Get them, get them from everywhere is the word, right? Everywhere. And start pouring it in there. Now, what's the rational part of us say? Ted, how big is that jar most of the time? 
I mean, even if we got a big jar, it's this big, right, of, of oil. And he goes, you just pour it into those vessels. And she's standing there going, no, she, she goes. Chris Caldwell would be standing there going, did I tell you that the oil's in a container already? It's about this big. It's about right here. This is, this is all the oil I have. I, maybe I misspoke. Maybe I mis you misunderstood me when I said I only have this much oil. And he says, go get as many vessels as you can get from everywhere and start pouring it. And Chris Caldwell would be going, it's only going to be this much in one vessel. I'm telling you because it's just, right? And the Bible, if we read right there where it picks up, he tells her to go do that. And it says, um, so verse 5, so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. She had enough. It was enough for her to sell and pay the debt and to live on after that fact. God did a miracle in her midst. And for us, when we go out that door and we sit here and we run into somebody, there's going to be situations where God says, do this. And we're going to go, that's impossible. That can't happen. We can't make that happen. Lord, how on earth are you planning on doing this? And yet in every single instance that I find, I find that God says, if you'll dive in, you'll go, you go do, you dive into that situation, I will provide. I will take care of everything that is needed. I will bring it alongside. And we go, huh, how did that, oh, how did, how did that, how did that happen? What was required on her part? She went to her neighbor. Eloise, can I borrow some vessels? What do you need those vessels for? Um, I just need to borrow a few. Um, God's getting ready to do a miracle at my house, and I'm going to fill it with oil. She has to tell every. She's going door to door, and people saying, "What do you want my vessels for? What do you want all these? What are you doing?" And the, the whole neighborhood's going, "Well, she borrowed all our Tupperware. What on earth is she doing over there with all that stuff? She's still, she's carried in at least a hundred bowls into her." Notice, when she ran out of bowls, what happened? Ran out of oil. The oil stopped as soon as she ran out of bowls. So she collected a thousand bowls. How many would she have filled? A thousand bowls. Do you see that? Is that she had to dive in and believe that God was going to take care of the situation. She had to go, and then God provided along the way. He took care of it. And she had to participate in that. The reason she participated is because at the end of the day, what happened to her faith? What if she'd gotten one bowl, twice the size of the one that she had, and she filled it up, and it went all the way up? She'd go, wow, look, Ted, that's twice as much as I thought was in there, right? Twice as much. And she would have gone, right? <laughs> you get it, right? She would have been like, yeah, God did more. It gave me double what I had. But instead, she went and collected all those bowls. She dove in. She, she went right in the middle of it. And God said, here's enough to pay off your debt completely and... To live on from this point on. Because she was willing to die in the midst of it. Now, the idea of thriving to me is, when I look at Hudson Taylor's life, who was a missionary in China, I find something very interesting because he was such a nice guy. That there was a woman who lived next door to him whose husband was a sailor. She was an older woman, and so... She would ask Hudson to travel across town three or four miles further than she could ever walk. I and mean, she didn't have money to take a cab or anything like that. And she would say, would you please go over there to where to the dock area and collect my husband's paycheck for me and bring it back to me? And he said, absolutely. I'd be glad to do that for you. I'm helping out a, a lady, uh, an elderly lady. I'd be glad to do that for you. And she signed a piece of paper saying he could pick up her husband's check. And so he would do this regularly for her. Well, he was in final exams. He was going to be a doctor. They wanted to, to learn to be a doctor before he went to be a missionary in China. He thought that would be a good skill to have. And he was in final exams for this. And she came to him, knocking on the door. And she said, hey, um, Hudson, can you, can you go pick up my husband's paycheck? And he went, yes, ma'am. I'll be, I'll be glad to do that. And what he did instead was he went to the bank across the street, took out money out of his own account, all of his money. He took every cent he had. And he just gave it to her, and then he would go pick up the check to replenish his money after final exams were over. Do you see that? He, uh, she already got her money. He, was, he didn't have any money. He was going to go pick up the check to reimburse it himself. So he goes. He gets time after final exams are over. He goes across town, walks the four miles, whatever it is, 
over there to it, walks up to the guy, and he goes, hey, I'm here to pick up, you know, Miss Eloise's check. And the guy says, I'm sorry, Miss Eloise's husband, he abandoned ship, and he went to go down to where they're digging for gold down in such and such country, and so he's not going to get paid. He's AWOL. And Hudson goes, oh, 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 that was every cent I had. Um, and I mean, it's like a punch in the stomach. And he went, okay. And so he walks the four miles back home without anything. And because his bank account's empty, he doesn't have dinner that night. And so he sits there and he starts praying. He's like, Lord, um, you, I'm in a bind here. I was doing something kind for this lady. I was ministering to her a lot. I didn't have time because, you know, I was in final exams. There was no way for me to do that. And so he gets sick in the meantime. He has this illness. And for three, four, five days, he's sick. And he recovers from the sickness. And at the end of it, he's like, his uncle's been bringing him some food to eat during this, you know, because he's been sick. At the end of it, he's like, Lord, you know I'm broke, and you know that I, what am I going to do? I don't have any money. I gave this lady all my money. And the Lord said, why don't you go back over there to the, to the thing, to the docks, to the sailor. He says, Lord, I've already been over there. The guy explained to me. He showed me all the paperwork. He showed me everything. There's no reason for me to go back over there. And God says, just go back over there. Because he's talking to Chris Caldwell, right? Go back over there. And so Hudson gets out. I hope that along the way he was whistling. Do you think he was whistling? He's been sick. He's without his bank accounts empty. We think, right? We walk out. We walk out that door with our rucksack, our backpack. We're not going to be broke. We're not going to be sick. We're serving God. And yet, sometimes we're sick. And yet, sometimes our bank account is empty. Sometimes we're in need, right? And he walks four miles. Golly, Ted, I've already done eight miles to get there, right? Over and back once already. I'm going to walk four more miles. This makes 12 miles that I've walked. And he walks over there. He walks up to the thing. The guy goes, oh, I'm so glad you're here. He's like, what? So glad. I mean, because I don't have any way to get in contact with you. He said, I made a mistake. There were two guys with the same name. Your guy didn't go AWOL. There's another guy with the same name that went AWOL. Here's the money. Gives it to him. Who are we in those moments? This is our walk. This is our faith because it's not when we, as soon as we go out that door, there's not people going to run up to us and go, hey, would you do me a favor? Tell me about Jesus. I really would like to know about Jesus today. I really was thinking today, March 21st, would be the day that I would give my life to Christ. So if you'll just explain the plan of salvation to me, that'd be great. They're not going to say, you know, something easy for us to do. There's always going to be an issue wherever we go, and we have to depend on God for that. And in the midst of that, he grows our faith and provides. Do you see that? I want us to see because that is thriving. I want us to know without a doubt that is thriving. When we sit here, let's look at some scriptures in the New Testament because these are so vital for us. Um, look at James 2, 14 through 20. And we'll finish up here. James 2, 14 through 20. At, before we read that, you know, in, as part of the going, if I go to the beach and I walk up and down the beach, which I like to do, I like to walk up and down the sand and the ocean just kind of comes up at my feet, there's something great about it. It's a lot of fun to me, and it's beautiful, and it's, you know, very serene, and I get something out of that, right? If I put forth a little more effort, and I get up, let's just be honest, I'm not, I'm not an early riser, Jill's the early riser, I'm not the early riser. Remember I told you, she wakes up, she goes, ooh, what a great day. <laughs> she, she's like, okay, I don't, I don't, but if I make the effort to get up early and go walk on the beach, then what do I get? Watch the sunrise, the birds are singing, there's more shells on the beach than there were any other time of the day, and there's added, it's better. You get my point? If I come back, if I put forth the next little bit of effort and I come back at night, if I, if I oh, but there's TV to watch, or there's, I just want to spend time over here eating at this restaurant, where if I go back out there at night and I walk, what do I find? I have to tell you, I'm in Sanibel Island one, one time, and I'm walking down the beach at night because I love it. They have a lighthouse at the end, and I'm walking down toward that lighthouse. There's something splashing over here in the water, and I was like, what is that splashing over there? And it was an alligator. <laughs> it was right there on the edge of the water. I went, this is not a good idea to walk at night. If, if you go at night, 
you'll see sand crabs scurrying all over the, the beach. And at times, there'll be sea turtles that come up out of the water and bury themselves over there in the sand and lay eggs. And if you're there at the early time in the morning, sometimes you'll see little bitty sea turtles that go right back out into the ocean. And it's unbelievable. It's amazing. But it takes a little more effort, a little more effort, a little more effort. If I put a mask on and I walk four or five feet out into the water and I put my face down in that water, oh my goodness, there's stuff everywhere. There's fish, there's, right, there's stuff everywhere that's just, it opens up an even bigger beauty to our lives. It makes it even more of an experience to us each time requiring a little more effort from us, a little bit more, and then God goes, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, and he does more and more in our life. And for many of us, we sit here and we're still debating about whether we're alive or not. We're still feeling as if we're cursed. We're still feeling as if our lives are not what God wants us to be. And we're disappointed and we're dissatisfied. And we need to realize that we're alive and we need to dive in and then we need to thrive. And that requires us to be serving God out in the world. It requires us to be obedient to where he calls us. In James chapter 2, because I don't want us to let hold of this, because too many of us want to argue about this. 2.14 what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe to tremble. But do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And he keeps going on from there. For us, we tend to think that good church means sitting here and being entertained for an hour once a week. And God goes, watch this. And then after a while we go, I'm kind of dissatisfied. I think I'll try one of the other 665 churches in the area. I think I'll go there. And for a while, I'm entertained for my hour. And I go, and God goes, and we go, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yet God says, I'm sending you out with that backpack that I've filled up, that backpack, and you're ready to go. And I want you to go out into the world, and I want you to see with new eyes and hear with new ears. I want you to feel with new hearts, and I want you to make an impact. In Colombia, I want to unleash you into the world to be about my business. That is where God is calling us as a church today. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the love that you fill each one of us with. The joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control. Because we have those things if we have your spirit within us. You have given us those as gifts. And Lord, you have used those things to send us out into the world. You've said go. You've told us to go out and be about your business. That there are works. There are things that you want us to be your hands and feet in this world. Things that you want us to do. People's needs you want us to meet. And that's not just physical needs. But sometimes it's listening. Sometimes it is sharing the gospel. Sometimes it is just giving somebody a hug in the midst of a crisis like COVID. But Lord, it is us being present out in Colombia and in this world where we can make a difference for you. Lord, you let us participate to grow our faith. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Jill is going to lead us in song. We're going to stand and sing together. And this morning you may be questioning about your faith. You may be questioning about what, what it is that God wants you to do. Let me say this. This has been my walk with Christ. This is the way that I have lived my life. This past week, last Sunday evening, Jill was gone all weekend helping her mom move. And we talked about going out of town. And so while she was gone, I got up a few things, packed up a bag, told Sela to pack up a bag. And Sela goes, where are we going? And I went, I don't know. And she's like, okay. And so Jill comes home and she's kind of tired from working with her mom all weekend, packing boxes and all that kind of stuff. And she goes, What's with the suitcases? And I go, let's just go somewhere. And she's like, oh, okay. Because she's, she's a great wife. I mean, she doesn't sit there and go, well, I don't have a plan and have uh, some organization. You know, we just got in the car and we started driving. And in the midst of that, God blessed that. That's our walk with Christ many times. 
Look at Abraham in, the, in Genesis. Where are you going? Where do you want us to go, Lord? I'm not going to tell you. Just start walking. He does that to us at times to test our faith. And for us, you may say, I don't know what it is I'm supposed to do when I go out there. I don't know who I'm supposed to be with. And God says, I will provide in that moment. Don't you worry a thing about it. I will provide. So as we stand and sing, if you're at this point of deciding, hey, what, what it is, what does God want me to do? Will you come as we sing? And I think today is what, number 34? Is that what it is? Come on down here, Joe. You're, you're, you're the leader of this. I mean, they don't want to hear me sing, that's for sure. Um, if you're looking for, hey, just starting March 21st, what is it that I should be about this week? You should be inviting people to come to an amazing Easter egg hunt. And the reason that I know that it will be amazing is because God told us to do it. And so I'm expecting him to show off. That's what I'm expecting. So I'm expecting you to go out to kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and invite as many people in your neighborhood, wherever you go, be inviting them 10 o'clock here this coming Saturday, the 27th. He is Lord. He is Lord.